just by talking about my research trajectory, because I think it's a common research trajectory amongst people with technical backgrounds like me, uh, and it might be something that you can potentially relate to as well. So I'm just going to start with this. Um, so I think everyone with a technical background has thought at some point, well, I'm going to build the optimal noun for such and such topic. All right, so filling in the blanks for me when I started my PhD, uh, I guess being an optimist, uh, I believed I was going to build the optimal language and IDE for building interactive user interfaces. So during my PhD, I built a new representation for interactive user in interfaces, and it looked something like this. Um, I'm not going to go into the details about this, but I'll just mention that it's a visual language, spreadsheet-like language, um, uh, and it looked like that. And I thought, you know, and still think that this work is neat and interesting. And by some metrics, you could argue that this work was good, uh, but it doesn't completely solve, filling in the blanks for myself, uh, building user interfaces. And actually many of the things that we need to solve for filling in the blank for myself, UI development, aren't actually technological. So in my case, I realized that people often need good help resources when doing UI development work, or really any sort of development, even if the language that they, even if the language and tools that they use are usable. Uh, so what does a technologist like me tend to do? Well, of course, we built technology to solve these non-technological problems. Uh, so in projects led by my former PhD student, Yan Chen, uh, we built a system for asking for help from other people. Uh, and the, the rough idea was that we wanted to create a Siri for code editors. Uh, this was before OpenAI, Copilot, and, and similar tools. Uh, so at this point, you know, when you wanted to ask for help, and still arguably now, when you wanted to ask for help, uh, what we did was we built something that made it easier to verbally ask your question to other people. So you could verbally say out loud something like, can you help me refactor this code to use I don't know, a map uh, or, or a such and such tool? And other people would uh, respond with messages and also they could propose code changes to uh, your code. Uh, this tool made it easy to kind of package up the request in context so that they could easily submit these proposed code changes. Uh, and then the developer could integrate those proposed code changes back into their code. Uh, and again, this was good by some metrics and interesting, uh, but it doesn't completely solve the problem. Uh, so then, you know, in my research trajectory, I built a deeper appreciation for the theory and non-applied research, and I decide, well, I'm going to study these non-technological non -technological problems, uh, which usually leads to the discovery that, wow, this is a really complex socio-technical problem. And to be sure, when I say socio-technical, uh, socio-technical systems are ones where social factors can influence how technology is used in complex ways, and technological factors can in, uh, uh, influence social interaction uh, in complex ways as well. But then I realized that my prior work for uh, on building and studying uh, wasn't for naught. It did help me understand the larger phenomenon, even if the system itself doesn't necessarily gain widespread adoption. So I end up at, wow, this is a complex socio-technical system that I can start to understand through building and studying. And I would say that's kind of where I am now in my research trajectory. Uh, so I still do a lot of system building, but it's usually to explore some socio-technical phenomenon. Uh, and programming is definitely a complex socio-technical problem. So I feel like uh, to a lot of you, this research directory might be, I don't know, painfully naive or painfully relevant. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to share it because hopefully it's something that you can laugh at or possibly relate to. And of course, my experience is not the rule, right? So there are definitely some people that can stop at this first step because they do actually solve exactly what they set out to solve. But I think that's the... Uh, 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 I, I think that's the exception rather than the rule. Uh, and then there are also plenty of people who are wise enough beforehand to know to start out here in the first place. That wasn't me. So that said, let me get into it. So I've, I've long been fascinated by the idea of treating programming as a human endeavor. And the research focus of my group at the University of Michigan has been on designing programming tools around these usability needs uh, and to better understand these usability needs through tool building and studying. Uh, 
So broadly speaking, we've taken three approaches to this. One, to design and build new programming languages around the ways that people think and work. Uh, two, to study and redesign existing programming tools around usability needs. Uh, and three, to enable better education and or support uh, in the context of programming. In this talk, I'm going to focus on some of the work we've done on the second and third approaches, specifically on a thread of our research dealing with studying and building programming uh, tools for collaboration in programming. So I'll start this thread by making two claims to hopefully try to convince you that programming is a socio-technical problem. Uh, first, the first claim that I'll make is that collaboration is fundamentally important in programming. Now, when I say collaboration, I argue that there are two main kinds of collaboration, explicit and implicit collaboration. Explicit collaboration in programming includes activities like synchronous and asynchronous discussions, uh, and many common organizational practices like peer programming or code reviews uh, or working as part of a programming team. But beyond the explicit collaboration, there's also implicit collaboration where there isn't necessarily direct communication between people, but instead there's communication through a shared artifact. Uh, so, for example, the vast majority of Stack Overflow usage is people learning from each other's question in, questions and answers uh, rather than people asking a question directly. Uh, right? So you, you look at something that someone else asks and learn from the answers uh, to someone else's question. And I would even include potentially referencing doc documentation or using a library written by someone else under this category of implicit collaboration as well. And I think we can all agree that these are pretty fundamental activities in programming. Now, my second claim is that the tools available for programming collaboration can greatly influence what we can achieve. And I think this is easy to illustrate with a couple of examples. So for one, I think it's pretty safe to say that without version control systems like Git or SVN, most of the large scale open source software that we use daily just wouldn't be feasible to build if you were, for example, share, if you had to, for example, share code through email. And also Q&A systems like Stack Overflow have, as many of you know, become really crucial resources for uh, programmers at all levels. Okay. So in our research group, we've looked at many of these different kinds of collaboration, but I'm going to focus in this talk on two areas in particular. Uh, first, I'm going to focus on tools that we've built for synchronous remote discussions about code. When I say synchronous remote discussions, I mean people are communicating remotely, but they're in the conversation at the same time. That's what I mean by synchronous. Uh, and then second, I'm going to focus on uh, some studies that we conducted with mixed ability programming teams. Uh, so specifically uh, teams that have some programmers or one or more programmers who have visual impairments and one or more programmers who do not. And just before I uh, get into the research, I just want to note that for a short talk, I'm going to not give a comprehensive overview of related work. Uh, and I'm also going to present some things a little bit out of order in which uh, from which they were published. Uh, just for the sake of a clear progression in a, in a short talk. Okay, so I wanna start with some work on improving code discussion tools for real-time discussions. Um, so, uh, oh, and this was work done with April Wang, who's a current PhD student uh, and faculty collaborators here at Michigan, uh, professors Chris Brooks and Paul Resnick. So we wanted to better understand how people use discussion tools. Uh, so we wanted to understand specifically how do people did discuss code? And we were also interested in how these discussions can help future collaborators who later on join the code base uh, understand that code base, All right? So the focus of the studies that I'll talk about specifically were on data scientists, however, uh, we believe that the, the findings apply beyond data scientists for reasons that I'll uh, get into later on. So in terms of setup, what we did was we asked 24 data scientists to work in teams. Uh, we asked them to work in remote pairs uh, on, on a uh, data analysis problem. And we had two conditions. One was uh, with a shared code base, one uh, where they could see each other, uh, see each other's work in real time. One was in non-shared code base. Um, the focus of what I'll talk about here is uh, what we found in the condition of the shared code base. Uh, so in the shared code base condition, uh, uh, collaborators had access to 
a version of Jupyter Notebook that would sync in real time with their collaborators. Uh, they also had things like shared cursors, right? So in Google Docs, for example, you can see what other people are highlighting, where they're typing, et cetera. Uh, and they have the ability to chat on Slack as well. Uh, we ran four different uh, sessions with these groups and we manually recorded uh, the communication and coded uh, the results as well. And then after our study, we asked a third participant for every group uh, to try reading the code that they had produced. And this was, again, to kind of simulate what it's like to onboard a new team member uh, to existing work, right? So uh, we're kind of studying two kinds of uh, uh, collaboration and communication. One is synchronous while you're working on the project. Uh, another word, uh, another is what happens when you want to catch someone up. Um, so. Uh, for example, one of the focuses of Slack is uh, that you have a message history and that's supposed to make uh, uh, it easier for new people to be added to channels uh, and understand what happened in the past. Uh, so in a nutshell, our findings from this study, or at least the relevant ones here, were that one, chat messages were often invaluable for understanding code that was created collaboratively. So importantly, documentation was not a substitute for the content of these messages, right? So even well-documented code that had maybe code comments or other written documentation didn't necessarily have the information that chat messages contain uh, because chat messages often uh, contain design rationales and explain things that the teams of programmers tried but didn't end up in the final code. So one participant put it, I think, really well. They said, by reading the code, I can know what they were doing. But with the chat messages, I can understand what they were thinking. And I can understand kind of the process behind uh, uh, the creation of this code base. The problem, though, is that these chat messages were typically disconnected with code. Uh, so there are a few problems. So one, references in these messages between participants became stale. So for example, if someone refers to line 24 and they say, I think we need to delete line 24, and then they modify the code, uh, then later readers will have no way of knowing what line 24 was. Uh, this could even be a problem for people who are participating in the discussion uh, at the time, right? So uh, the code is changing throughout the conversation. Also, important context isn't captured uh, in these conversations. So for example, uh, our participants would often highlight regions of code when they were discussing them. Uh, so for example, they might highlight a portion of code and they might uh, in chat say something like, what does this do? And understanding that message requires that you know what this refers to. So these are problems in every synchronous remote uh, discussion or remote discussion tool for code. So there are lots of tools that support real-time collaboration between programmers, uh, and they all look something like this. They all have a shared code editor whose contents are synchronized between participants and a chat box, or in some cases, video for shared discussions between participants. So in essence, the problem is that pretty much every tool for chatting about code keeps the conversation separate from the code that's being discussed. They might as well be two separate applications. So we tried to add a little bit more permeability to make the chat tools for, uh, for more, more appropriate for discussing code. Uh, and we gave the system that instantiated this idea the, the name chat codes. So I'm going to refer to these features under the system name chat codes. But again, these the system really is just a design for exploring uh, uh, ways to improve communication about code. So the first way that we added some of this permeability was to make it easier to refer to specific parts of code in conversation. Uh, so we we did that by adding what are called deictic references, deictic references to chat. So deictic references are references that point to what the speaker means. So someone might say this line of code, and this refers to a specific part of the code base. So in chat codes, this is what a deictic code link looks like. Uh, and these chat messages can have links that point to specific parts of code when a, when a chat participant hovers over it. So one of the system design contributions that the paper makes uh, it was that uh, it had a design that made it e relatively easy to create these deictic code links. I'm not going to go into that design in general. I'm just going to talk about the code links instead. So you can see 
as the user hovers over particular parts of the message, you can see that uh, the relevant part of the code is being highlighted. So the specific part of the code that they're talking about is being highlighted here. One of the challenges with these didactic references is that code is always changing throughout a conversation. So these references need to refer not only to a specific part of code, but there's also an implicit time in code version that they refer to. So we found that these didactic references needed to be combined with the mechanism for navigating to prior versions of code as well. Uh, so with chat codes, whenever the user uh, uh, references a didactic code link, the code window that shows where that uh, reference is pointing to will show the specific version of code that that link was created on. So for example, if you look at the part of line four uh, after the equal sign, you can see that when the user hovers over here, that part of code reverts back to the ver to what it looked like when that message uh, was created or when when the link was created. All right. So this means that code references that are created uh, now can never go out of date even after the code changes. And then finally, because code is changing throughout a conversation, we also wanted the chat history to reflect those changes. So chat codes also includes a notion of change history. And what this means is that changes are displayed in line with the code as code diffs. So chat participants can look at how the code evolves throughout the conversation uh, by looking at the conversation. So here in this example, Alice edited the code. And as soon as she did, a message saying that Alice edited the files displayed in chat. And this can be expanded to show the exact edits. Uh, so I'm just going to let this replay one time through. So again, Alice is making changes to the code. This message saying Alice edited this file appears in the chat. And if you want to know the specific edits that uh, Alice made, then you can expand and you can get a uh, diff view uh, kind of in line with the chat to see what changed as this conversation was going along. OK. So uh, chat codes, again, I'm, I'm using the term uh, chat codes to, ref to uh, refer to these three features that we combined. Uh, I think one of the nice things about the feature design uh, for this as well was the fact that they these features don't interfere with the core functionality that other code discussion tools have, right? And uh, in my opinion, as, as, and as our user studies show, they also added very little complexity to the end user experience, right? So there are extra features that you are able to make use of uh, uh, if you want to, but if you don't make use of them, essentially they don't get in, uh, they don't get in your way. Okay, so I'm just going to show a quick video of chat codes in action. Uh, so just note that the video has no sound, uh, and so there aren't any captions. I'm just going to be talking through the video. Okay, so in this video, I have uh, uh, two windows side by side. So imagine that these are two people working on two different computers. Uh, on the left here uh, is Alice, and on the right is Bob. Bob's going to ask a question asking, uh, why doesn't, and then he refers to a particular part of code, why doesn't this my map function work? Alice can look at uh, this message and respond. So Alice can point to a particular line of code and say that this, referring to part of line four, uh, is incorrect. Bob can hover over this to see what this actually refers to. Right, and so Alice can also make changes to the code. Uh, and as Alice does, both of them can see uh, that Alice edited the file. Uh, and then here, Alice says fixed, and uh, Bob can go ahead and explore what changes were actually made to the file as well. All right, so just a, a really quick demonstration of, uh, of chat codes in action. Okay, so we did three evaluations with chat codes uh, in the specific context of use that we studied was guided code explanations. So these aren't multi-person conversations, uh, but or that we studied in chat codes in the context of, uh, but these were explanations that involved one person writing code and describing what that code does. Uh, we focused on this study setting because it was a little bit more controlled and allowed us to get um, 
uh, a better understanding of, or a, a more detailed understanding of how people use chat codes features, whether you're writing an explanation in chat codes or reading an explanation. Okay, so these guided explanations are often non-sequential. Uh, so you can imagine like in a programming course, if you're walking through a complex piece of code, uh, you often, you know, you often don't want to explain that code linearly. You might have to explain one part of the code and then go back and edit that part and jump down. Uh, and so comments aren't really fully appropriate for these kinds of guided explanations. So we did three studies. The first focused on instructors that were creating these guided explanations. Uh, and we compared it with four tools, uh, chat codes, standard chat, uh, video, uh, uh, video recordings, and forum postings. Uh, and we had four instructor participants, uh, so four computer science instructors. Uh, the second study focused on students reading these guided explanations, and we compared chat codes and standard chat, and we had eight student participants. And then the third study was a more quantitative comparison between chat codes' as features and those of video-based explanations. Uh, so again, for a short talk, I'm not going to go into any of the, I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, in the findings, but I'm going to talk about what I think were the most important takeaways. Okay, so for me, the most important takeaways from this evaluation was one, that instructors who are writing these code uh, uh, explanations often use these didactic code references. So every participant who wrote an explanation independently uh, uh, mentioned that they liked the ability to point to a part of the code because it helped ensure that they were on the same page as the person who was reading the code. Uh, in the conditions where they didn't have chat codes, they would almost always highlight the region of code that they were talking about by selecting it. So for example, if they're uh, recording a video, they would usually highlight something, uh, a, a given piece of code while they talked about it. Uh, two, uh, another important finding, I think, was that people who wrote explanations with chat codes as features were effectively interleaving code changes with messages. So on average, they would write about two and a half messages and then change code, then write two and a half more messages and then make some more code changes, et cetera. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, if you've done HCI user studies, one of the thing with systems, one of the things that, uh, can be really interesting is when you see behaviors or usage patterns that you didn't anticipate that people benefit from. Uh, and that was one of the things that we saw here. So one unanticipated usage pattern that emerged uh, with several participants would be that they described what they were going to do, but then they would make self-explanatory code changes and use the inline code history as their explanation of these changes. So they would say, I'm going to loop over all of the data points, and then they would just write code to do that. And that code change would be kind of a self-explanatory uh, 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 self -explanatory, uh, diffs showing it, uh, you know, that didn't need any additional comment on it. Uh, third, another thing that we found was that these code references and the code history could be useful for future collaborators. Uh, collaborators. Uh, so in our reading study, we found that because the references always stayed up to date, uh, participants were able to browse the code history. Uh, so all participants used the feature where they were able to go back and look at old versions of code and incrementally build up that code example. Uh, and we found that uh, readers preferred explanations written in chat codes uh, universally whereas only half of the uh, explanation writers did, the other half preferring video, largely because it was faster. And then finally, one thing that I'm not getting into in this talk was that we had, again, a set of techniques for making easy to create didactic code, re didactic code references, uh, but we found that it was easy enough that participants were actually able to create these references with a very minimal tutorial um, and that it didn't get in the way of using other chat features. Okay, so. Um, that said, uh, we, okay, so the motivating study that I talked about initially was with data scientists. Uh, the communication aspects of data science that, uh, that I talked about in the context of chat codes is design. Uh, we think, again, that those uh, uh, communication needs are more general than data science. However, collaboration in data science can look a little bit different than it can look in general programming. So collaboration in data science is really common, 
But data scientists don't typically have the same sorts of formal processes as software engineers. And this might be in part because data science work is often exploratory. So there's often no set goal ahead of time, but they're often exploring what they want to work on or what aspect they want to focus on. Also, data scientists are often uh, different from general purpose programmers because they typically care more uh, about the result than the code that produces it. All right, so for that reason, it could be a waste of time to write clear and optimal code, and documenting process is often not a priority. So um, some of these, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, April Wang, again, the PhD student that I mentioned, uh, led development on adapting some of these features to chat codes uh, to the Jupyter Notebook platform, which is often used by data scientists. Uh, so she developed a plugin named Callisto that extended chat codes as features, but also made them more appropriate for data science. So April made some key additions. So first, to address the challenge that data science often puts an emphasis on output, in particular uh, visual output. Uh, uh, and visual output can be really important in data science collaboration because it can allow team members to visualize and discuss data. So. Uh, April added an automatic visual diff mechanism so that you could see not only the changes in code uh, as chat codes did, but you could also see the changes in output as well. So uh, if you do, uh, you know, if you do one step slightly differently, then you can see uh, what's what are the consequences for this form of visual output. She also added the ability to to add didactic pointers to annotations. So for example, one participant could point to a part of the graph like here and refer to it. So they might say these data points are outliers where these now is going to refer to this, uh, is going to refer to this annotation. Another challenge that we dealt with in the context of data science was that although didactic code references were useful for notebook readers, uh, we found that users didn't tend to create them when doing exploratory programming work. Right, so again, there's often less emphasis on documentation because you don't know if you don't necessarily know if you're going to keep the code that you just wrote when you're doing exploratory work, as data science tends to be. Uh, so April come, came up with a technique for automatically creating these didactic references by automatically creating contextual links uh, with a message and uh, between a message and the part of the code that a user was editing or looking at at the time that they sent that message. So the key insight that April had here was that recall in this context was a lot more important than precision, right? So in terms of precision, it's okay to have erroneous references, right? So people can look at a chat message and they can tell, oh, the system inferred this, uh, that this chat message was talking about this cell, uh, but usually if it's erroneous, then it's kind of easy to tell that that reference didn't make sense. But recall is really important because if a message refers to a part of the code uh, and it's it, it impossible to understand that message uh, after the fact, then it's really important that you're able to uh, capture which particular uh, part of the code that message is referring to. So again, in this context, recall was a lot more important than precision. Okay. So in general with systems work, I, I just want to have general takeaways for other researchers beyond the specific system design. Uh, so my general takeaways for this work would be, my first takeaway would be one, that there's still a lot of work for, uh, uh, there's still lots of room for improving synchronous discussion tools uh, about code. So some things in particular that I think could be interesting to further explore are making it easier uh, to share your code in runtime context. Uh, particularly for remote uh, communication, just making it easier to share that relevant context with other people that you might communicate with uh, remotely. Uh, also, another area that we haven't had a chance to work on that came up in our studies was uh, in systems that had something like, like a shared cursor, there were, there were different levels of awareness that you can have for what a collaborator is doing. So 
you know, when you have a shared cursor, you can have awareness of the low level, like what specifically are they working on? Uh, but it was still really hard for them to build awareness of like what's the higher level thing that they're working on, right? So I could see, for example, that someone is assigning such and such variable, but what's the higher level goal that this person is working on? Um, uh, it would be interesting if future systems could help uh, build awareness of that. Um, maybe by capturing more of the history. So maybe if you could see more of the history of what someone had worked on, then you could build a higher level awareness. Uh, my second takeaway would be that relatively, sim relatively simple additions uh, for, uh, in the context of chat codes, these simple additions were dictic references to code segments, uh, to code changes, or to, art out to output artifacts, uh, can improve synchronous discussions uh, for both participants and for future readers, right? So these weren't complex techniques. These were simple additions that, um, it, you know, that we showed can in, improve uh, discussion about code. Uh, so one thing that I think would be great to explore in the future is how we can make it even easier to create these kinds of references that I mentioned. Okay, so there's lots more in these papers that I can't get into in the context of this talk, but uh, you know, obviously you can look at these papers for more, for more details. Um, I said I would pause um, this part, this, this talk is kind of in two parts. Um, I think uh, I'll pause here to see if there were any questions that I can answer on that first part in particular. I should still have time at the end for questions as well, but I just wanna pause here to see if there are any intermediate or clarification questions that anyone wanted to ask. Okay, thanks. And um, great first part of the talk. It's um, really interesting to see this work. I was curious, um, how does this real-time code collaboration, how do these interactions compared with um, kind of more punctuated code collaboration, like I guess GitHub or uh, those tools? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I would say, so I didn't compare this specifically. Okay, so I'm going to call Git and GitHub, I'm going to call them asynchronous, um, even though a tool isn't inherently synchronous or asynchronous, but I think Git and GitHub and other version control systems tend to be used um, uh, asynchronously. I didn't specifically compare them, but I would say that uh, there are different contexts of use for this these synchronous collaboration tools versus a tool like GitHub. Um, so um, uh, the context of use for these kinds of communication tools where uh, really like in GitHub or in Git, or, uh, I should say, you typically don't want to do things like commit intermediate results or things that might break the build or uh, that are incomplete. Uh, whereas in this context, in the context of synchronous discussions, you need to, like oftentimes you have to have these conversations in the middle of actually building out a feature. Um, and so I don't think any synchronous communication tools are, like, I don't think those two things are in competition. Um, although I do think it'd be great to have one system that could handle both like asynchronous and synchronous collaboration. I, I think that they're very different use cases for, for those two kinds of tools. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you very much. I was also, if you don't mind the second question, I was curious, yeah. you mentioned that in code chats, uh, participants tended to put um, some of their code documentation in the chat. So did you find that that also led to less traditional documentation, like comments or, um, yeah, I guess function oh, documentation, or um, was that more of an addition? So just- Yeah, fun. Yeah, funny enough, you know, obviously we I can't comment on like how everyone would use it, but for our limited number of participants, um, they actually just didn't. Oh, if I remember correctly, the code comments that they had were very minimal. Um, so they they tended to leave chat messages on the whole instead of code comments. Um, but again, I, I think part of the reason for that is just because comments can be great, but you can't really have comments that really give you an explanation of a complex piece of code because, you know, those comments, you know, code can only be written in one order minus, you know, I know some IDEs allow you to have more complex views, but the file is only going to be written in one order 
often the order in which code is executed or the order in which code needs to ex be explained is not in that same linear order. So like really sometimes to have an effective explanation, you need to jump around in the code uh, and like explain something down here, then something up here, something over there, uh, something in another file. Uh, so yeah, so I think comments were kind of uh, maybe orthogonal to some of the goals. Like they would, they would write, if I remember correctly, they would write comments just as like a very, it, just to explain some very small piece of code rather than the, rather than explain like how they're building up the whole example. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? And you can just unmute since I, I don't have, the, I can't see who's raising their hand or anything. Uh, I think uh, that's all the questions we have so far. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, in that case, I'm going to move on to some work uh, that we've done with mixed ability programming teams. So this still falls in the context of uh, programming collaboration, but um, uh, 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 kind of a different thread that I found really interesting. Uh, so this was work led by Molly Pandey, uh, who is uh, my current PhD student, and Sheila Madrin, who's a faculty collaborator here at Michigan as well. Uh, and Molly presented this at CSCW um, uh, a few weeks ago as well. Uh, okay. So for this work, we studied uh, mixed ability programming teams. Uh, so these, again, these are programming teams where some programming team members uh, have visual impairments and others did not. Um, so the reason that we we're interested in this in, was in part because programming uh, is considered to be a relatively accessible field in STEM for people with visual impairments, uh, right? So like, unlike some other STEM fields, uh, all of the information, or you might think all of the information that you need for programming would be uh, accessible through assistive technologies, right? So it's largely code based, which you can access through something like a screen reader or a braille display. Um, and it should be relatively accessible. Uh, and in the Stack Overflow developer survey, uh, it, about of about 90,000 participants, 1,350 respondents reported having uh, some level of visual impairment. Uh, uh, but we wanted to understand the experiences of programmers with visual impairments who work uh, in mixed ability teams. Again, those are teams where some team members have visual impairments and some do not. Uh, so we recruited and interviewed 22 programmers with visual impairments. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, our uh, uh, data was skewed. So we uh, were able to recruit 18 participants who identified as male and four who identified as female. Uh, so it's unfortunate that we weren't able to get better representation. Um, but our, our participants were, uh, our participants did have a variety of work settings. So some participants were freelancers, other participants work uh, at small startups, large companies, uh, government organizations, and some in university and research settings. Uh, our participants used a wide variety of languages, editors, and setups, but all the thing that they had in common was that all of them worked collaboratively in some capacity. So our research questions were focused on understanding what are their collaborative practices uh, and how the collaboration affects their uh, uh, work patterns. And prior work has looked at programmers with visual impairments largely without regard to these collaborative practices. Okay, so um, I just want to kind of give away, uh, I just want to talk about some of the takeaways that I thought were really interesting from this, uh, from this work. And obviously, again, uh, you can look at the paper for more information uh, about more takeaways as well. So the first takeaway that I thought would be interesting to kind of discuss an overview is just how much more there is involved in programming to writing code uh, and, and writing code and communicating, I should say. So for example, if you're writing a skill for Amazon Alexa, right? Um, there are lots of situations where like you're writing code in order to be the glue between a whole bunch of different services, right? Uh, so like if, if any of you have written uh, uh, a, 
If any of you have written a command for Alexa, you might know that there's just a lot of kind of setup work involved and setup and configuration work, uh, even if it doesn't actually take that much code to write the, the new Alexa skill. Uh, so one participant uh, talking about the non-accessible uh, components of programming uh, discussed this in particular, uh, saying in order to start programming for the Alexa, you need to create an account on their website. And a very interesting thing was that after you fill in the form, for instance, you need to submit the form. And I have to spend like five minutes looking for the button, uh, and I looking for the button, and I accidentally scrolled to the top. Uh, then I saw at the top that it says submit. And so these are some issues that can cost you time until you find them. So especially now that we live in kind of a, uh, for a lot of people, like there are a lot of services that uh, the code that we write uh, will depend on. Uh, and so even if, you know, the tools that we use for writing code are accessible, the tools for configuring and setting up these services are not always accessible. Uh, and in this case, this participant was saying, um, as this participant was saying, uh, uh, the tools that you need to configure and write an Alexa command are one such example. Another takeaway that I thought was interesting about this work uh, was that a lot of accessibility issues are, are the result of collaborative practices and not just inaccessible code editors or other tools, right? So you might imagine that if we just make uh, VS Code, Microsoft VS Code, or Microsoft Visual Studio, or whatever IDE of choice. You might think that if you just make that accessible on a Braille display, and if Slack is accessible, et cetera, uh, that uh, most of these accessibility issues will be solved. Uh, but as our participants showed, that's really not the case. So one participant uh, talked about, well, several participants uh, mentioned that their organization uses pair programming. Uh, and one participant specifically talked about how when they do pair programming as a collaborative practice, uh, it limited their contribution. So they said, so usually I'm the person writing code because obviously I can't look over the shoulder. Uh, I would like to be uh, able to do the same thing, but it's not essential, me being the person looking over the other person's shoulders. Right. So uh, if you are familiar with pair programming, typically you have one person writing code. Uh, uh, the other person uh, uh, either literally looking over their shoulders, but either way, uh, giving some form of feedback on that code as well. Um, and what this participant was saying was that they were able to, in, when they did pair programming activities in their workplace, they were able to be the person writing the code uh, because they had, you know, when they were writing the code, they were able to set up uh, uh, the uh, accessible technologies that they needed in order to write the code, but they could never uh, take the other the other role of uh, giving someone else feedback on the code that, as they're writing. Um, another or several participants also mentioned um, uh, the use of software architecture diagrams. So one participant in set uh, specifically said. Uh, I, I wouldn't know how the components connected together, so I couldn't contribute there the way that others were, uh, was anyone could have managed the issues of the sequencing of the design process. I didn't ever have a sequence of job, jobs that needed fixing. It was always just a single program, uh, and that was part of a process that had a breakdown in it. So what this participant is saying is that um, because they have because they relied on software diagrams in order to plan out the larger software architecture uh, within their organization, um, and those software diagrams were not accessible. What that meant was that it limited their ability to it limited the roles in which this participant was able to work. Uh, so this participant ended up uh, in this organization being handed small specific tasks rather than more architectural uh, ar architectural tasks. And then finally, the third takeaway that I uh, just want to quickly overview here was that many code styling guidelines were also written with cited developers in mind, right? So oftentimes organizations will have organizational specific like code style guides uh, that developers within that organization are supposed to follow. Um, but those don't uh, those don't always take into account programmers with, with visual impairments or programmers who are accessing the code in a different way. 
Uh, so for example, one participant talked about how they, like when they were learning programming, how they tended to optimize the code that they wrote for braille displays. So they said, from very early on, I got into habits that were better, that were better on a braille display. So you don't put spaces around equal sign uh, because you could fit two more characters in your, in your braille display. And I would always put braces on the same line. So basically, uh, I kind of stylistic, uh, kind of stylistically, I learned uh, that some things uh, that I have since discovered are not mainstream. There's also information that was invisible to screen readers. So one participant mentioned uh, how, you know, their screen reader didn't emphasize, uh, in the case of using camel case variable names, it didn't emphasize that, right? So they said it shouldn't be this, it, it shouldn't all be this is my name, all lowercase. The variable is called this capital I is capital M, my capital N name. It shouldn't be all lowercase. It shouldn't be all uppercase, right? And so this was information that was not visible uh, to screen readers. And one participant talked about how they uh, tended to put navigation markers that helped them navigate uh, their own code uh, uh, out of necessity, but that were... Uh, 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 but that could kind of get in the way when they were working collaboratively. Uh, so they said, I was using the comments and the separated dashes. Uh, when you hear a line being read as dash, 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 uh, then that's how somebody would know, oh, here comes my, my next comment. Uh, this and kind of just as, as much description as possible. Okay. So uh, those were some of the takeaways that I wanted to highlight and share, but again, there are many more in the paper. Uh, one thing that I want to note here is that uh, a lot of participants also mentioned, described how the burden of fixing these accessibility uh, issues, whether it's inaccessible tools or coll collaborative practices, uh, how the burden of fixing these problems fell on the shoulders of, of uh, our participants on top of their uh, normal work. So they had to educate their colleagues, and they had to advocate for themselves on top of uh, all the other work uh, that they had to do. And all of these challenges happened in a context where their job, uh, prospects for, for promotion and livelihood literally depended on other people's impressions of them as well, right? So, um, it, it, you know, uh, there's a problem that if you do something like ask for help, then that might change your colleagues uh, impression of you, even if the thing that you have to ask for help on uh, might be out of out of your control. Okay, so uh, that said, um, kind of uh, coming back up a level more broadly, one of the things I'll hope you take you'll take away both from this work and from my previous work is again that programming is a complex socio technical process and it warrants close examination. Uh, and some of my work has explored this through tool building and through studies, uh, but Again, there's still a lot more room to grow uh, and improve. Okay, so let me, okay, so I think, uh, yeah, so I should be okay on time. So I'll end there. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks again for having me. Uh, and yeah, thanks for coming. We should have, what, seven minutes for questions? Is that right? I'm really curious about how these kinds of different tools for remote programming uh, compared to existing pair grown programming, like say, um, <clears throat> like, you know, Zoom and sharing screens. Like, I'm curious on what benefits that your program has in comparison to existing solutions. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, in the case of, um, okay, so uh, I've done several, Okay, so let let me focus on uh, the the work with data scientists in particular. Um, going coming back to um, coming back to this, I'll just say one. So we didn't compare um, uh, we didn't compare the uh, Callisto, which was the data science plugin to uh, video chat and shared video specifically, but this system that I talked about, we did compare to, to video chat. Um, so I'll, let me talk about both really briefly. Um, okay, so in the context of Callisto, which again was, sorry, this is going through. 
in the context of Callisto, which was this collaboration tool for um, for data scientists, um, uh, we again this wasn't we didn't compare specifically with Zoom, uh, but one of the things that would be really challenging. Uh, that we did in this study, one of the things that would be really challenging on Zoom uh, would be the task of actually onboarding a new member uh, in order to understand uh, in order to understand the code base, right? So um, especially if there are multiple people working on this code base, you would need to somehow, well, you would need to record the contributions that everyone is making to the code base. Reviewing the code history would require uh, scrolling through videos uh, if you didn't make other tools that made it easier to navigate that code history. Um, so because one of our focuses was onboarding, we decided that that wouldn't even be a, compar a, a great comparison point for this particular study. Um, and so we didn't compare because I think onboarding would just be ridiculously difficult uh, in Zoom. Um, one of the system that I only described briefly, um, so this system where developers can make a verbal request uh, and uh, uh, other helpers can respond with code changes uh, and then developers can integrate that code. This we did actually compare with, specifically we used, we used Skype with screen sharing, but same idea. Um, uh, video communication plus a shared uh, 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 kind of code context. So in this tool, one of the interesting things that we found and the advantages, the actual advantage that we found in this tool over Skype was that when you asked a question or requested help from someone else via Skype, there's kind of a, I don't know if it's, I don't know if you'd call it a social explanation, expectation or, or not, but there's kind of an explanation that you're kind of going to stay on the line with them while they work through that issue. Whereas with this tool, when it captured your voice, sent your code context to other people, what it allowed was it allowed other people to work uh, asynchronously on that code. Um, and it seemed like it was just, I don't know if it, again, I don't know if it's a matter of social um, like kind of social grace that you expect to be talking with the other person if you're online with them or what. Um, but in this case, like the advantage of this over something like Zoom or Skype was that while the developer, while after the developer sent their request to remote helpers, then they were both able to work in parallel better, right? So the developer knew that their request for a code change was in the hands of remote helpers. So then they would go on to another thing. Uh, and then when helpers finally sent their response, the developer could also like, if, if it's interrupting something that they're in the middle of, then they could wait to uh, uh, to look at that response. Whereas you can't, it'd be kind of rude to do that over Skype. Um, uh, and so that's not going to be advantageous in every situation. Um, but in this case, this was one of the advantages that we had over something like Zoom. Um, uh, but I, I think, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. But yeah, I, I think also different use cases are like Zoom would be better for something like education than a tool like this would be as well. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the question. Sorry, for, sorry if the answer was a little long-winded. Okay, great. I actually had one quick question. Uh, the quick question I had was, uh, so one, great talk, Steve. On the the first uh, study that you were talking about for a code chat, um, you talked about the the sort of context of kind of guided explanation of some code. And I'm wondering, kind of in more of an educational context, if you were to design some tool to support this sort of asynchronous instruction or even synchronous um, kind of code reviews in a more educational context, do you think there's different um, sort of considerations that you would need to have? And I'm wondering what, what types of support might be helpful for this type of more educational context as opposed to uh, collaborative uh, paired uh, programming task. Thanks. Yeah, th yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. So one of the, actually some of the work that I didn't get into was more, uh, a lot more education focused as well. Um, so um, 
uh, a lot of anything. So, um, okay, so in educational context, uh, it, it, one paper that I didn't mention uh, that came out recently at CSCW that focuses more on, on education is called Puzzle Me. Um, and uh, you can just look at like my CSCW papers if, you, if you're looking for that paper. Um, but uh, we found that some of the differences in needs were one, uh, asynchronous communication in the context of education just often was not ideal because if you're focused on education, then one, you, you unless you have a complete like background of where a given person is coming from, it's hard to get, it's hard to write an, a long winded explanation at the right level. Right, so I might write a whole explanation, assuming that you know you know what a promise is. Um, and if I do this asynchronously, then someone's going to read this explanation and they're going to get lost as soon as I mention you know the term promises. Uh, right, so for that reason, oftentimes I think synchronous discussions are better for education. And in the context of conversations about ed education, one of the things that we found is that, yes, peer-to-peer -peer or like one-on-one -on -one or like small group conversations are great, but one of the things that you often can benefit from in, in the context of education is getting more summative overview. So uh, in the context of like a programming course, you might learn more by seeing, uh, you know, not just the solutions of people that you were paired in discussions with, but getting an overview of like oh, how did the whole class solve this problem? So like being able to, for example, browse other people's solutions or being able to um, uh, uh, look at and run the code of other uh, another person's solutions, maybe, in, in write, maybe even write test cases. Um, so I think like the way, like I think one, you need synchronous discussion tools, but also you would want, um, uh, tools that make it easier for peer learning by um, uh, uh, allowing students to get more information, I, I think, from kind of the rest of the classroom, rather, e even if they aren't in a discussion um, uh, with that, with a, a specific group of people. Yeah. So let's thank Steve again. And yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks again for having me.